In our last video, we covered the creation of Norath, the birth of the gods of power, and the beginnings of its elder races. If you haven't seen that video yet, I encourage you to watch it before this one, as some parts may be confusing otherwise. This story continues off from Rallo Zek creating the orcs and ogres in an attempt to bolster his growing army. The children of Rallo Zek had been born, the orcs on Fadwar and the giants and ogres on Tunaria. The giants, being one people at that time, flourished in the Northlands, vast and fertile grasslands that stretched from the ocean to great mountains both to the east and south. In seclusion, they made huge cities and castles and built a civilization rivaled at that time by very few of the other intelligent races. The giants were a strong nation and worshipped their creator, the warlord. Armies and outposts guarded the passes leading into the Northlands, and the few times their home was attacked, the invaders were utterly crushed. Far to the south, another civilization was growing in power as well. The ogres also worshipped the warlord, arguably even more fervently than the giants. And of all the races, it was the ogres who quickly proved the most interested in battle and plunder, and their empire grew outward from their mountain home until it eventually encompassed a large portion of Tunaria, largest of the known continents. Their knowledge of magic grew as did their greed, until they became weary of only Norath, and when they learned of other planes and dimensions, invaded the plane of Earth itself. While the ogres to this day sing songs of their initial victory over these thirteen mighty beings, it is also true that when one of these gods fell, soon another arose from the Earth to take his place. The ogres could do little against a foe eternal and were eventually defeated, their armies forced to fall back through the portals that had brought them to that plane. Hordes of earth elementals and flesh-eating plants pursued them, even into Norath, and southern Tunaria fell victim to the wrath of the twelve gods. Rallus's forces were scattered and broken, unable to continue their current assault. Rallus Zek looked down upon the ogres, and in seeing their defeat, grew furious. While he was a lesser deity, he was still the god of war, and in his arrogance he too opened a portal to the plane of earth, and personally led his forces in an invasion. An inconceivable battle ensued, one of which history says little other than that the heavens themselves shook, and in the end even the warlord was defeated by the Council of Wraith. Rallus and his minions were cast back into the Plains of Influence, and the greater gods came together, creating a barrier such that no lesser god or creature could ever pass into the Plains of Power again. They also saw fit to punish Rallusek for his treachery and arrogance. And so, in what some view as spite and others justice, the gods cursed the warlord's creations. Thousands of ogres were slain, and their empire collapsed around them. Those that remained scattered into small tribes in southern Tunaria. The orcs, giants, and goblins, also of the warlord's creation, were not spared the god's wrath. The fate of the orcs is almost totally unknown, for they are not a people to keep history, concerned only with the present. The goblins were also cursed, but no writings remain of their punishment, for they no longer keep records of their history, perhaps an indication of the severity of their curse. Stories passed down from other races tell that the Anxfen, as the goblins were known then, were entirely exterminated. From their ashes were born the four goblin races, each stripped of all knowledge and not informed of the existence of the other clans, nor of their origins. Each clan was transported to a separate environment to help preserve the god's will. The gods were not entirely without mercy, however, and granted each clan a staff with a crystal affixed to its head. These crystal staves aided the goblin clans in understanding their environments. But the giants remember what happened to them, for the greater gods came together and in their combined might brought an age of ice to the Northlands. Their civilization fell swiftly, their cities and holds crumbled in the cold, their crops and livestock froze and died. Famine and chaos spread everywhere, and the surviving giants boarded a vast armada of ships and sailed east and then south in an attempt to escape the curse. But the greater gods saw this too, and watched their escape, conferring with each other. When the giant's fleet reached a point between Tunaria and Kunark, the gods summoned a hurricane of unearthly power, with gales and waves greater than any sailor had ever seen. Many ships were sunk, and over two-thirds of the armada were blown by the mighty winds to the shores of the nearby lands, to be dashed against the rocks and cliffs. One third came ashore east of the oasis of Mar in the desert of Ro, while another third landed in the burning wood on the west coast of Kunark. The remaining armada sailed on, praying that they had escaped, but the warlord could do nothing in their aid, and Zagony, queen of air, drew wind to their sails and led them to the coast of Velius, where they landed short on supplies and unable to sail further. 
Thus the greater gods brought their final curse upon the giants, for they had fled the Northlands to escape an age of winter, only to find themselves marooned on an entire continent of eternal ice and snow. In the desolation that was the Desert of Roe, many of the giants died from the heat and lack of water. The few who survived became a wandering band of nomads, fiercely afraid of others, attacking anyone who would wander into their ever-moving camps. They are called the Sand Giants by those who have encountered them and lived to tell the tale. Those who landed on Kunark became the hill, forest, and mountain giants, and were soon enslaved by the Ixar, rulers of the Sibilician Empire. It wasn't until that empire fell that these giants became truly free again, able to begin anew. The final group of giants, those who landed on Velius, became the Frost Giants and Storm Giants. These were the mightiest in the Armada, those who had survived the Great Hurricane, and it was their anguish and pain as they were blown south through the waters that named the Ocean of Tears. They eventually adapted to the cold and began to rebuild a civilization in central Velius, always careful to stay clear of the ice dragons who also dwelled there. But whether frost, storm, sand, mountain, forest, or hill giant, they remember and they curse to this day the greater gods, the rulers of the Plains of Power. As the chaos of the gods swept over many parts of Tunaria, an occurrence stranger still was visited upon the elves of the Eldar Forest. On a stormy night, amid the howling winds feeding the blizzards in the Northlands, a couple emerged from the woods, alerting the sentries on watch. The guards stared in dismay at first and then rang the alarm summoning the captain of the guard. Captain Petron looked down at the disheveled pair to see their king and queen, lost to them so many years, returned. Where they had been, no one knew, but the captain could see a wildness in their eyes. He imagined an incredible ordeal, to be sure, to keep them from home these past 300 years. The two were immediately brought to the palace of the new king, their cousin, who had taken rulership of the kingdom in their absence as was proper. The king, of course, began preparations of ceremony to return the kingdom to its rightful king and queen as soon as they were healthy enough to return to office. Sadly, the cousin would never see this day, as both he and his wife died of a mysterious illness within two months of the king and queen's return. And so the new kingdom began in death. The royal family began to turn away from the ways of the forest and look beyond it to other lands and those that dwelt there. They looked on with envious eyes at their neighbors and soon spread the desires of conquest throughout the council. More and more, those in the council who were friends of the forest began to move away, take ill, or disappear on hunting excursions altogether. The ideals of the elves turned to an empire. The elves built great armies and took to the primeval forests of Norath, creating a vast empire that spanned several continents. By this point, the Eldar Forest, the elven realm of old, spread across the entire southeastern quarter of Tunaria. Tree communities and marble cities were built in the forest clearings and meadows, their white towers and spires climbing out of the forest higher than the tallest tree. Legends say this prosperity drew the jealousy of Salusek Ro, Lord of Flame. He arched the spine of the Serpent Mountains, bringing heat from the burning sun to the ancient forest. The rivers ran dry, it rained less each year. And while the great elven druids fought long and hard using their powerful magics to combat the change, they could only delay the inevitable. Slowly, the forest gave way to desert, and eventually even the fair elven city Takish Hees crumbled, and the elves were forced to flee to Naria, leaving much of their greatness behind. What had survived the great kingdom of the elves they loaded onto ships they built from the remainder of the forest. They then sailed east toward the continent of Fadwar, where their scouts had found a suitable area for them to call home. Tenaria lost to them, they began to build anew in the woods of Fadwar, and soon took hold of a large portion of its lands. As the dust was settling over the now sun-scorched Tunaria, the last of the gods came to Norath to create their people. Methaniel Mar, god of valor, and Arlasi Mar, his twin sister, the goddess of love, created the Barbarians, a hardy race who settled the cold and rugged Northlands, near the ruins of the giant empire. Being the youngest race, they were generally unwashed and rugged, possessing very few social graces. While their culture was primarily warlike, there were those among them who began to believe in something more. By this time, the other civilizations of Norath had either long since declined or were well on their way, and this small minority of barbarians saw an opportunity to triumph where others had failed. Perhaps it was the seed of wisdom planted by the Mar twins, or perhaps it was only by chance, 
But as the barbarians spread out across the lands, warring with both each other and any other race encountered, this tiny movement continued to grow. And so, even amidst the desolation and war, there was hope. This small and enlightened group of barbarians were the fathers of the human race, and they rapidly gained a foothold throughout the lands, studying the lost art of geomancy. The Combined Empire, as these barbarians which began to resemble what we now call humans, spread throughout the known world. This empire then died even more quickly than it grew, and for reasons still unknown. And while they are the ancestors of every human on Norath, and their relics and ruins still litter the lands from Otis to Fadewar, little history of this period remains. After the fall of the Combined Empire, the remnants of mankind dwelled mostly in the center of Tunaria, inhabiting primarily the vast and fertile plains of Karana. Villages appeared and prospered, several reaching the size of towns, and two even became cities. To the west, a strong and noble band of humans, led by Antonius Bale I, founded Kinos under the lofty principles of law. Freeport, to the east, became an active and dangerous port of call for all who dared to venture into the Ocean of Tears and beyond to the shores of Fadewar. Humanity, much to the disdain of the elder races who watched from afar, remained strong, even daring to rename their home after one of their own instead of one of the gods. The great continent of Tunaria would forevermore be known as Antonica. This is not to imply, however, that humanity was at peace. Competition was fierce, and when resources grew scarce for one reason or another, many groups abandoned the promises and alliances of their past and fought. A few leaders spoke out against the violence, urging the masses to remember why they had fled the cold north. Others reminded them of their former glory and the might of the combined empire. These leaders insisted that humanity adhere once again to those principles which all had agreed. Explorers and adventurers had been returning from afar with tales of elves, dwarves, and other strange creatures, as well as descriptions of ancient abandoned cities. A few even came back with limited knowledge of sorcery and the mystic arts. And when that discontent minority of leaders heard of all this, they became both jealous and determined. A small, frail man of great intellect called Arid led this group, and he formed them into a council. They quickly became irritated, even disgusted by their fellow man. Leaving a small network of spies behind, the remainder of Arid's followers fled the city of Kinos and boarded a small fleet of ships. They sailed to the west and landed upon the barren coast of the island of Otis. The land was sparse and uninhabited, and quite appealing to the council and their people. They quickly built a city of their own, dissimilar in almost every way to both Kinos and Freeport, for it was almost entirely a towering castle. Aridin, it was called, and within it the scribes and scholars who called themselves High Men gathered and analyzed reports, captured books and scrolls, and other artifacts brought to them by their spies. The first human mages since the Combined Empire were born. Wizards, sorcerers, and enchanters occupied the great halls of Aridin and grew immensely in both power and knowledge. It came to pass some years later that a small group of erudites discovered the lost art of necromancy. They were branded heretics, and great conflict arose. For the first time in several hundred years, the erudites fought. They engaged in a civil war not entirely dissimilar to that which they had loathed and fled from back on the mainland, but there was one significant difference. They did not use swords and bows, but rather magic, and the result was terrible. Lives by the hundreds were lost, great buildings and structures destroyed, and eventually the heretics were forced to flee Aridin, to hide and regroup in the southern regions of Otis. In one final battle, great mystic energies were released, and an immense hole leading to unknown depths beneath the earth was created. Into the sides of this chasm the heretics built their own city, which they called Paneel, and while both sides still seethed with anger and hatred towards one another, their fear of what the last battle had wrought kept any further conflict at bay. And now here we are, in the Age of Turmoil. The beginning of this age has been filled with wonder. The elder races have begun to reclaim their former glory, while younger races have matured. An active economy stretches across Otis, Antonica, and Fadwar. While conflict and battle are hardly rare, it has also been centuries since open war has plagued the lands. A myriad of alliances and factions have been formed, friend and foe, plot and scheme, and the world of Norath is ripe for action. But those are stories for another day. This has been Lore of EverQuest, The World of Norath. In my next video, I'll be covering the kidnapping of Furunavai, the birth and rise of Lannis Tavil, 
and the Battle of Bloody Kithakor. Thank you for watching. If you're interested in more EverQuest or MMORPG related content, feel free to stop by my live stream at twitch.tv slash bobbybick, and feel free to subscribe to the YouTube channel where I'll be posting more lore videos in the future. See you next time!